Hi and welcome back to a new video. You might remember the CAT PC which we built a few months ago and in this PC we featured a colorful motherboard which is a brand that is hardly available in Europe. It's not available at all in Germany and even back then it was a big effort to get the CAT motherboard imported into Germany. And then after my system build or during the system build I noticed that the colorful motherboard was surprisingly well organized in BIOS and the software was also working pretty well. So I reached out to colorful and asked them if they can send me a more realistic mid-range motherboard that we can test. So here we are with the iGame Flow C790 D5 motherboard which is this one. It is a white motherboard which is more rare and also the price point I think is quite interesting. The MSRP is $390 and in the price region of $390 it's yeah not common to have white motherboards. You sometimes have motherboards that have like white heat sinks but they mostly have still black PCBs or then from Gigabyte there are some motherboards with like silver PCBs but not white PCBs. So I think this could be quite interesting. So we want to check out a more undercover mainboard vendor and see how well this motherboard performs. This video is powered by Seasonic's Prime TX 1600 watt premium PSU. With a peak efficiency of 94% at 50% load, this PSU is 80 plus titanium and cybernetics titanium certified. I've been using Seasonic Prime PSUs myself for years in extreme overclocking scenarios and I was never disappointed. All necessary safety features are in place such as OPP, OVP, OCP and OTP and will make sure that your system is running as stable and safe as possible. I also find it impressive that Seasonic is so convinced of their own quality that these PSUs come with a warranty of 12 years. That is just impressive. So make sure to check out Seasonic's Prime TX 1600 watt PSU in the link below. Before we start looking at the motherboard we first take a look at the box itself and what's included. The design already nice and shiny. There's some quite interesting marketing blah blah on the site. You can pause and read if you want to. It's quite interesting because they state that this is um, a new design of a motherboard ready for the new VR era. I'm not quite sure if I would agree with that. On the back side we see a ton of features that are advertised. We will go over them later. I first want to talk about the memory support. They state 4 times DDR5 memory slots, support up to 192 GB and support up to 7800 MHz plus. Well, they actually don't say support up to. The missing up to is actually quite interesting because just reading that you could assume that you can run 192 gigabyte with 7800 megahertz which is far from realistic I would say. Best case maybe 96 gigabytes so dual 48 with that kind of memory speed. But then again if you go to the website and check the QVL list you can see that the fastest validated memory sticks are 7600 megahertz. So yeah. That's quite confusing and then also if you go to the product page and scroll all the way down there is an advertisement for a ton of features. In between they talk about memory and memory speed and there they list 8200 megahertz which is interesting. So it seems to be three different um, yeah, things they're talking about. I think the reality is somewhere in between. That's why I got those 8000 sticks from G-Skill also in a silver design which I think matches the board visually perfect and with these we want to test what kind of memory speed we can reach realistically. I also have a 14900K. This one was running 8000 on an Apex on core. So that's kind of yeah I know that the IMC is not too bad on this uh, specific CPU and the memory can do it as well. So we will figure out what kind of memory speed we can actually reach on the board. In the accessory box we have a manual that is in Chinese and English. It features most of the important um, yeah, information so I think that's fine. I already read through it here in the cable box. That is quite cool. We have most of the important cables also in white like SATA cables, some of the RGB adapter cables and then there are also some RGB adapter cables that are only black but I think that's quite nice to have some of them at least in, in white. There is a USB stick that contains the drivers for the motherboard. That's nice and also not bad actually. These are screwdrivers that you can get for yeah quite good amount of money on AliExpress. They're pretty cheap but I used them before from yeah, different branded companies. But the quality of these is usually quite nice for building PCs. So that's not bad to have. Even the Wi-Fi antenna that is included is white. So if you're planning for a white build that would be quite cool. I'm just researching a bit more stuff about this motherboard online and then on their website I could find that they have a detailed guide on the debug codes of the motherboard which is very helpful and most vendors don't include it to that detail. 
So pretty much every code is fully described here. That can be quite helpful for debugging. And with that, we're starting to talk about the motherboard because I was just checking about the debug LED and the information that it contains. We will get to that later. First, let's just start about the general features. Obviously, it's a 4 dim board, as I said already, LGA 1700 C790 chipset. It has an 18 plus one phase VRM design. We will check that out later once we disassemble the heatsink. The heatsink design is also interesting, I would say. It kind of fits their flow theme, so everything seems to be kind of liquid flowish style. At least it's something unique. I'm not sure if I like it. That's something subjective, that's up to you. I think it's something unique you don't see very often with this kind of shape. So it's kind of interesting to me, especially with also the, the white PCB. It's kind of a white and, yeah, white and silver PCB and that's why it also fits with the white and silver heat sinks on the motherboard itself. Expansion slot wise, also not too bad actually, because there's something underneath here, underneath this, they call it a dust protection cover, something. Yeah, it's a bit unfortunate that it's made out of plastic because you can see if I put it back, because it's plastic, this part right here is aluminum. And the plastic, yeah, as you can see, it looks a little bit different. So even though they tried to match it with the silver, it's not quite the same, so it doesn't look as nice. But I guess that's, yeah, it's, it's quite difficult to match plastic and aluminium to get it exactly the same style and they made it as a dust cover which I can understand to hide these slots that are lying underneath. We have in theory at least mechanically two PCIe X16 slots but only the top one is fully connected with 5.0 X16. This one is actually just an X4 slot same as the one on the bottom and same as well it's an X1 slot but they're all three PCIe 4.0. But at least in theory, you would have plenty of options for any kind of like expansion cards, I don't know, Wi-Fi modules, whatever you're looking for. These slogans right here, I always find pretty cringy. I mean, gamer customization and design for the future, I don't know, always feels to me that they just slapped some random slogan on there just to have something on there, not quite sure. Yeah, gamer customization, what does it even mean? With the heatsinks removed, we can take a look at the M.2 slots. The heatsinks also contain thermal pads. Obviously, you have to peel off the protective film first. And I'm not quite sure if I said 4.0, but I just read that this slot is actually 3.0. So we have 5.0, 3.0, 4.0, 4.0. All of the M.2 slots, all four of them are PCIe 4.0, which you can also see by looking at those nice tables. I'm not quite sure if you can read it. But here, for example, there is one of those tables that state that this is a 4.0 slot and it's connected to the chipset. Those tables are always very helpful and I really like having them on the motherboard. That's why it's quite unfortunate that the table on this slot is covered by yeah, most of the heatsink of the chipset and the table of this one is fully covered by the chipset heatsink. I guess that's one of the typical things where one team is designing the PCB and the silk screen on it and then there is another team that's making the heatsink and they probably did not communicate with each other. That's why unfortunately this one is, yeah, the table is hidden underneath here rather than have it maybe sitting underneath. But yeah, it's pretty simple. Those three M.2 slots are chipset and the top one is connected to the CPU. All of them are 4.0. In some other reviews online, I found that they were criticizing the top M.2 slot not being PCIe 5.0, which I don't really agree with. If this is a mid-range board with a lower price tag, then I would personally also prefer having this a 4.0, making it a little bit cheaper. And also, if you get a mid-range PC, I wouldn't go with a 5.0 drive. They are just more expensive, they have speed you usually never need, and they're getting much warmer. So yeah, just get a good 4.0 drive. Quick look at the I.O. shield, which seems to be a bit, yeah, off, not quite sure. You can maybe see if I press on it that it's not fully centered. You might have some issues plugging in the USB port or like the display port. Seems to be, yeah, a little bit out of line, but probably okay. I will test if I can plug everything in. Apart from that, we have 2.5G network, Wi-Fi. It's only Wi-Fi 6, but still. Then a single Type-C, plenty of Type-A, HDMI and display port if you need it. And also there's a clear CMOS button and the one underneath is apparently to flash the BIOS from the USB drive, which I still have to figure out how to do it because it's not listed in here. 
I found a PDF document online where it says you have to first download the BIOS, obviously put it on a FAT32 drive and then rename it to CF under slash BIOS dot bin and then plug it in the BIOS update dedicated USB slot, just plug 24 pin ATX, switch on power and then press the, yeah, the button for five seconds which you can see here. And then it should take about four to seven minutes to flash the BIOS. And during that, the blue, red, yellow indicator light is supposed to flash, but I have to figure out where that one even is. I just wanted to try it. And this is also quite interesting. I added the USB drive in the dedicated USB slot, just connected the 24 pin ATX. And if I switch on the PSU, it is switching on the entire motherboard. Not sure if it's supposed to be like that or yeah, sometimes some motherboards are doing that for whatever reason. I think I will set the CPU into the socket that sometimes fixes this. 4900K is now sitting in the CPU socket. Now switching on the motherboard, um, well, the PSU again and well, also the motherboard. So this didn't fix it. Obviously, I mean, the CPU is not connected to CPU power, so it's not gonna do anything. Huh. Now also added a single memory stick, added the CPU to power, switching CPU, well, PSU back on. Perfect. Weird. That is sometimes really weird. I had it before that without a CPU in a socket, some motherboard switch on. Strange, strange, not sure. So yeah, okay, CPU in the socket, memory stick attached, then it doesn't switch on anymore. Now I can also see the indicator light and we will now proceed to flash the BIOS. Add it to a different and empty stick. Why is the motherboard switching on again now? I don't get it. And now the CPU is also getting warm. I took the components back out, put them back in, and now with a standby power, it's not switching on. And also the BIOS seems to be flashing. I had to fully assemble everything because it kept switching on for whatever reason. And I'm not, not even sure if I yeah, aborted the flashing process at the specific state because I had to switch it off. We'll have to see if it now stays on or not. Power for the graphics card would be nice. It went straight to Windows, but at least I can now check that BIOS version 10.11, which is the latest one, was successfully flashed. So we can finally start with the actual test. The BIOS main screen seems to be very well organized. That's also what surprised me on the CAT motherboard. We have the main system information on top, then also memory where you can enable XMP if you want to, SATA and drive information. You can also set the boot priority. On the right side, we have fan monitoring and also the fan curve settings. You can select all the different output channels of the motherboard and then what kind of configuration you want to have, standard or even do manual configure your fan curve accordingly, apply, close. So that is a very straightforward. On the bottom right, we have the easy OC settings, which default is default. Then you can set it to performance and also energy saving if you want to, but there is no detailed description what it is actually setting. In the OC submenu, you have three other submenus, which I think is a very well organized. You have frequency, well, that's for CPU frequency, memory, and also voltage depending submenus, I think. That is pretty cool, pretty well made. That's something other vendors could also do because I think it's very easy and convenient to find your settings inside here. Now I will try what kind of memory frequency we can reach. First, we will load XMP profile one with 8,000. Not sure if that will work. If you hit F10, you even get a change list, all the things that changes due to like fan control and also the memory settings that we changed. I think that is very well made and that is on par with all the other mainboard vendors straight boot into Windows without any errors. Not sure if it just didn't apply it or what exactly happened. Okay, it just applied 8000. This was such a quick boot. I'm not sure if it's stable, but, but that's already amazing. Just running ADA64, even though it's not that high load, but to see if the bandwidth is there and it's, it's 118 gigabyte per second. So the, the performance is definitely there, 8000 C38, I'm, I'm amazed. That looks great. You can see with all the read, write, copy, and also latency, this is as expected. And I will now try to do some kind of stability test to see if the memory is also stable at that frequency. 
I ran mem tests for maybe like 10 minutes and you can now see the first errors are detected. But with 8000 megahertz, it was still running much longer than I expected. I, would, I expected this to crash immediately, which it didn't. So I will go back to BIOS and set to like 7800. And here we have another error. But even with 7800, as you can see, quickly ran into some errors. 7600 looks much better. We are at about 50% coverage. It's been running for about 15 minutes. I also want to point out that I put a fan on the memory dims simply because memtest is very memory intensive and will put a higher load on the dims. They will get warmer, could become unstable. And since we don't want to test the sticks, but the motherboard, I made sure that they're staying cold. With now between 100 and 120% coverage, I think this should be fine. Has been running for about 45 minutes. Should be stable, always depends what you consider stable, but I think that should be a very solid base at a speed of 7,600. Everything is set to default in BIOS. If we run R23, you can see that the CPU is running fully unlocked. 4,095 is set to PL1 and PL2 limits of the CPU. And yeah, as expected, we can see the CPU hitting about 100 degrees Celsius, which is due to our AIO. And now I want to proceed to testing of the VRM, see what kind of VRM temperature we will reach with unlocked settings. For this, I will run Cinebench for about 20 minutes in a loop to see what kind of temperatures the VRM will eventually reach under load. After about 20 minutes in the test, we see an average CPU power draw of 295 watt. That is just limited by our 360 AIO. More is not capable cooling wise. And if we go down to the VRM, we see a power stage max temperature of 89 degrees Celsius. And also that's something I want to highlight, we will talk about later, is the max current of the VRM of about 264 amps. 89 degrees Celsius might sound much first look, but it really isn't, especially for a mid-range board. It's a worst case scenario that's also a condition you wouldn't even have during some kind of rendering load. You also don't have that much continuous load as with Cinebench. So I think it should be fine even, or especially if it's mounted inside a case where you have additional airflow, should be lower. And especially in any kind of gaming scenario, it's probably just maybe like 60 degrees Celsius. So I would say that is okay. Before we proceed uh, dismantling the heatsink and taking a look at the VRM itself, I first want to install the colorful software and also take a look at that one because when I tested it last time with the CAD board, the Mio motherboard, it actually was not too bad. The iGame software, a software I liked already last time, not necessarily for its design, but the functionality is pretty well made. It's pretty basic, but very quick and it works. We have an overview of all the system parameters and all the system components, which is handy. We can look at temperatures, fan and all kind of data like that on the main screen. If we switch to hardware, you first get an overview of all the RGB functionality, which works. I couldn't find any kind of bugs or things that didn't work. Same goes, for example, for adjusting the G-scale memory sticks and the RGB lighting, everything like this, and also the mainboard lighting just worked. If we go to the GPU, that is also quite cool. We can see it's detecting our 4090. And you can even adjust stuff like clock speed. That's basically an afterburner or like Reva tuner integration where you can adjust stuff. That also works. There are a few tiny bugs here and there. So for example, if you drag the power limit all the way to the right, yeah, the power limit thing disappears and then you have to either get it back this way or just go back to defaults. But that is a very tiny problem. But apart from that, everything you set here also applies and works without any issues. If we switch to monitor, there is an on-screen display that is very similar to what you get with the afterburner or the on-screen display from Reva Tuner, but for whatever reason, you can see it's throwing a huge error message. Not sure why that is exactly. It worked for me the last time with a different motherboard. Now it doesn't work. However, if we switch to taskbar, there is also this taskbar yeah, monitoring feature where you can get CPU, GPU, memory, and network functionality on the taskbar displayed down there, which I think is quite cool. Unfortunately, the other feature is for whatever reason not working. If we switch to game, there is a functionality to pair different CPUs with GPUs, as you can see. Yeah, automatically it just selects whatever CPU GPU combination you have, and then you can switch to different resolutions and check what kind of FPS forecast you can get. Not sure how reliable this feature is, where it gets the information from. I just found it interesting that they built it in here. 
The background load you get with the iGame Center is somewhere between 1% and 2%, which I think is acceptable for an RGB and monitoring software that's running in the background. Already removed the plastic cover of the I.O. shield. Now we can see that there is a heat pipe in between that connects both pieces of the aluminum heatsink. And this one is also quite substantial. Should have a lot of mass and also, I would say, quite okay surface area. Underneath the heatsink, we can spot a total of 19 faces around the CPU, where 18 are used for a CPU V-core power supply. The power stages are each rated at 90 amps max. If we look at the heatsink itself, we can see thermal pads just on the MOSFET contact area itself, not on the inductors, which is something that could be done, but the heatsink is not going, yeah, it's not standing over the inductors and also in our test, it was working fine. The colorful iGame C790 D5 Flow. I'm still amazed by how well this motherboard works and also the software, especially considering how much smaller this mainboard vendor is versus let's say ASUS, MSI or Gigabyte. Especially the software part, even though looking at how it's designed, I'm not a big fan of the, of the iGame software itself, but it just works. Maybe apart from the on-screen display, but I wouldn't consider this a necessary feature for a motherboard software. But everything apart from that, like the RGB control, adjusting frequency, fan curve, everything like that works without any kind of issues. Talking about RGB, one thing I didn't show in the video, if we flip the tiny switch on the bottom, it is indeed disabling all kind of RGB functionality of the motherboard. So not alone the RGB on the motherboard itself, but also the headers, like 12 volt and 5 volt headers, the entire RGB is then disabled. So if you're looking for a non-RGB white motherboard, that is definitely something cool because you don't have to rely on software to disable it. One thing I didn't feature in the video itself is all kind of testing I did around CPU overclocking and adjusting all those settings that go with it, such as CPU multiplier, cache multiplier, um, all kind of different voltages, load line calibration, all of that worked out without any kind of issues. I tested this for manual overclocking. It all worked out well. I didn't include it in the video because it would just stretch it out by probably another at least five minutes, but I can tell you it worked fine without any kind of problems. Regarding memory, it's a bit unfortunate that they have those weird and confusing different listings. So on the packaging, it's listing 7,800. Then on the QVL list, it's 7,600, which is also good for a mid-range motherboard, I would say. Then there is this confusing thing on the product page where it says 8,200. That's a bit unnecessary. That's something they should definitely fix because 7,600 for this kind of price range motherboard, I would say definitely a good thing. Maybe you can get 7,800 stable if you put a little bit of tweaking here and there because you could see even 8,000 would boot, but it's just not stable. But from my perspective, for the kind of price range, 7,600, very good result. The VRMs are solid. Also the cooling, I would say, is okay, even though we reached 89 degrees Celsius, but it's still a mid-range board and in the gaming category where you typically wouldn't run render loads 24 seven. So there, I think it is an acceptable result. I always find it entertaining though, to see that they list like 18 power stages with 90 amps each. So that's a total of 16, 20 amps. And you could see we had like almost 270 amps under max load. And you could see that we are running into a thermal problem. So maybe 300 amps would be the max. If we reach that kind of uh, stage, then it's probably running into a cooling limit rather than a power stage limit. That's always why I'm those, yeah. 90 amps per power stage is not really helpful, not really necessary, because you can see 16, 20 amps, theoretical max, but practical max is probably around 300 amps. Then you would be limited by the cooling. For better cooling, probably the different heatsink, more surface area, but it's still okay. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, unfortunately, those colorful products are not available in Germany and I think not available in whole Europe, which is a bit unfortunate. And that's also maybe a bit of my intention for this video, because I think there would definitely be a target audience that might buy these products. For example, this one with like white PCB and debug LED. If I just go by those two criterias, I cannot find any kind of other board listed here in Germany, especially for that kind of price. You can find some with like white heat sinks, but not with that kind of feature set. And I think for that price range, it's definitely delivering solid results and maybe colorful with this kind of yeah, motivation will maybe spread their market a little bit more out worldwide. I think they would definitely deserve that. All right, thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye-bye.